Welcome to Nesbitt School Community Town Hall to discuss our plans for reopening to in-person learning. I am Nesbitt's proud principal, Ryan Hansen Vera, and I'd like to thank each and every family for joining us this evening. Thank you for your support. My hope is to present this evening a strong introduction to our district and Nesbitt's commitment to a safe return to school for all. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the support of our BRSSD board, um, President Sawerna Bupali and Vice President Amy Koo for joining us this evening and supporting the Nesbitt family. Thank you for your unwavering commitment as we've developed this reopening plan. Um, Nesbitt Ohana, we come together tonight with one goal, to share our current best thinking for welcoming children back to campus. Um, to share our current best thinking for what our draft plan for reopening will be. Joining me tonight, I have a really great team that will be presenting um, some slides for us um, as we share our draft plan for reopen. So we'll start with um, our assistant principal's introduction. Hi, glad to be here tonight. I'm Nesbitt's assistant principal, Nicholas Walker. On to our uh, district CBO. I am Rui, I'm the CBO. Hi, hello, I'm Laura Goldman. I'm the Director of Special Programs. Welcome. Thank you. And Rui will get us started tonight. All right. Um, Laura, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. So uh, reopening requirements. So I wanted to open a little bit talking about the requirements to uh, reopen for in-person instruction. Uh, San Mateo County Office of Education uh, requires that all schools, regardless of what tier um, they are in, submit a draft reopening plan. Uh, we will be sending this presentation out um, afterwards. So you'll have a link to it. It's also available on our website. Um, so you can look through um, the criteria, but uh, essentially San Mateo County has said, you know, districts cannot just declare they're coming back. They have to have a well thought out plan that meets all of our criteria for safety. Next slide. Um, during the community survey, I know many folks cited, um, you know, community COVID rates as a key concern. Um, and so we always uh, stay on top of that. So right now, um, San Mateo County is in the red tier. I know everyone's probably heard about this recently. We were orange uh, up until this week um, at a case rate of about two. And this week, uh, it did spike to 5.7 cases per 100K. Um, our case positivity rate is actually still in the yellow, um, but you are assigned the more restrictive of the tiers that you are in. Next slide. So in terms of what this means uh, for a reopening, so our timeline right now um, is to begin a phased in reopening process starting January 19th. Um, our board's direction has been to do so in the orange or yellow tier. So, uh, you know, as conditions change, this timeline may need to be reevaluated. But our current plan is to begin the phased approach January 19th um, with TKK1 uh, preschool um, and SDCs, then adding in grades two, three, four, five, um, and then uh, progressing onwards from there. Um, the target date uh, for reopening campuses, as I mentioned for Nesbitt, um, would be January 19th. Um, next slide. And uh, just a note here about quarantine recommendations, um, obviously with the holidays coming up, uh, the state has recommended, first of all, to uh, minimize and not travel. Um, however, if you are traveling from other state or countries, um, we are recommending a self quarantine for 14 days after arrival. Thanks, Ray. So Nesbitt School, along with the other sites in our district, were tasked with putting together a site-specific reopening plan. So at the end of our presentation this evening, Nick will drop in the chat the link for that reopening plan. However, it is also available on our district's website. There are some important things to note about this draft plan. Um, collaboration and shared leadership with Nesbitt's teachers and staff is required for a successful reopening to a hybrid model. So Nesbitt staff will be engaged every step of the way. They will have um, operational planning sessions and input opportunities with me and Nick 
um, so that they feel confident about our site's reopening plan. Our staff engaged in their own reopening town hall last week on November 12th. And this is just an introduction. It is not a conclusion of our planning. There are updates to this plan that are already in progress, including updates to the instructional model for hybrid, which you'll receive kind of um, beginning information about tonight as well as we've made some shifts. Um, please understand that this is a working document and our goal is to have a complete and solid plan at Nesbitt to share with our families in a timely manner in time for reopening. So thank you in advance for your support. Um, next slide, please. So when developing Nesbitt's draft plan, um, we were making sure to outline our safe return in alignment with the four pillars of safety. So that is health and hygiene, face coverings, physical distancing, and limiting gatherings. So there will be daily symptom screening for students and staff, clear protocols for cleaning and sanitizing, um, and of course, um, a clear response protocol for any confirmed cases or exposures. Students and staff will all be wearing facial coverings um, while at school. Um, our staff offices are already fitted with plexiglass barriers and we have really taken care of our front office staff to make sure that our frontline uh, workers are taken care of with um, their barriers. And of course, our special ed staff is receiving additional PPE as they are coming in contact with numerous students. Um, physical distancing of classrooms um, will be set up to ensure that um, there is flow and safe space inside our classrooms. Um, and we also are maintaining a quarantine room or a get well space for any students that may be displaying signs of COVID on campus or that may be falling ill while they're here at school. Um, and of course, um, we're limiting gatherings. So there'll be stable cohorts of 12 to 15 students and those will be established and maintained. Um, next slide. Uh, Nesbitt is also planning for and has guidelines throughout the campus to ensure physical distancing. So we will have designated entry and exit locations, daily symptom checks, including temperature checks for both students and staff members. Um, classrooms will have assigned desk, backpack hooks, classroom cubbies, materials. We are thinking of all the things that the children may come in contact with to make sure that they are remaining safe. Um, there will be designated bathrooms and outdoor seating areas when it is safe for us to offer lunch and recess. And of course, we're having staggered schedules to maximize social distancing between the pods of students that we'll establish. Next slide. So this is, the, this is the big change and the big piece that we wanted to share this evening. So we wanted to share our ingress and egress school flow, just a fancy way of saying our drop off and pick up routines. So distancing is important during drop off and pick up for students. Parents will not be entering the campus. Parents and family members will not be walking to campus, dropping off children at the classroom doors or picking children up, children up from the classroom door. Nesbitt's typical school day practice was to gather for a morning school-wide meeting prior to children going to their classrooms. These morning gatherings were special. However, they also allowed for adults to visit in large groups on our blacktop. Uh, morning meetings are postponed until further notice. There are no visitors on campus and children will not gather in lines on the blacktop upon the entry to school. We need to maintain their distance and their safety. Based on the staggered schedule, Students will go directly to their classrooms. At drop-off, students will arrive at their assigned entrance according to their grade and their drop-off time. Um, they will receive a temperature screen and walk the identified safe route directly to their classroom. And as you see on the map, Nesbitt will have three zones for entry and exit. Zone A is at the front parking lot at that front drop-off loop. And that's going to be for TK, kindergarten, first and second grade. We also have zone B, which is also through the front parking lot, but we're going to be utilizing our blacktop gate that is closest to footsteps. And that's going to be for grades three, four, and five. And then in the back is zone C, that's our back parking lot. And that's going to be for sixth through seventh, sixth, seventh and eighth grade, excuse me, and our special day class. So for vehicle drop-off, um, students will be dropped off at the loading zone while parents remain in their cars. Students will then follow the route directly to their classroom. Um, walking to school. If parents are walking a child to school, the parent will say goodbye to their child at the appropriate loading zone, zone A or C. 
um, this will, um, there will be a yard duty uh, there to screen the child's temperature and escort them to make sure that they're following the appropriate route to their classroom. There'll be staging areas for parents so that there is an interruption to the flow and that we're still maintaining distancing. Um, parents will not be permitted, like I said, to walk their child through campus to their classrooms. And I know that's gonna be the hardest part, um, but it is to maintain their safety. We will allow biking to school um, and we will supervise um, the students um, so they safely secure their bikes, just like we always would. There'll be a station for them to screen their temperature and again, follow their safe um, route to their classroom. For pickup, students will be escorted to their designated zone for dismissal. Families picking up by car should remain in their car and pull up in an orderly fashion through the parking lot loop. And we are working with our front office staff to provide families with a sign to display in the windshield at pickup with the child's name and grade so that we can effectively get kiddos into cars and safely off campus. Um, walkers will exit for exit the campus at the correct zone and adults meeting a child to walk home together should wait in zone A or C. Um, we know this is a change. Um, we know this will require a lot of coordination. We know that we can all work together to make sure that we have a safe ingress and egress school flow um, and to make sure that our reopening for our students is safe. Our teachers are informing us and making tweaks to our map and our routes and we are confident that we will have a solid plan come a reopening date. So that is our ingress and egress school flow. Next slide. All right, so uh, we have carefully arranged our classrooms to follow health protocols and to meet social distance guidelines. Um, the way that we have arranged them will allow for uh, groups of 12 to 15 students to be in each cohort. Um, there'll be, the rooms will be established in traditional sort of row format. Desks will be spaced apart to maintain social distancing of students, uh, and there will be clear pathways to each hand washing station. Uh, each student will have a set of materials that they will store in a special location inside the classroom uh, that will remain there. Uh, and in August, we began the process of actually transferring uh, furniture, uh, marking things, um, arranging classrooms, uh, all, of the, all of the work that's necessary to set up a classroom began in August and throughout social distancing, teachers have been working hard to continue that process. Uh, last week, uh, we held a, a town hall for our staff in which we received feedback from them uh, and they made a commitment to us to have this process done by November 30th. Next slide, please. Student, staff, and community health and wellness is everyone's priority and everyone's responsibility here at Nesbitt. Everyone at school will have a temperature screening before entering campus. Our marker is 100.4 degrees or higher. Uh, if that degree is met, uh, a, a student or a staff member will have some time, a recheck will be done, and then if not passed, that person will not be allowed on campus. All students, staff, and adults on campus are expected to wear a face covering at all times. We ask that students wear one to school and then keep one extra with them every day. There are also extras in the classroom, cloth masks, and uh, in the office, there will be disposable masks for adults and students as well. Uh, students will be trained in hash wa hand washing routines that are implemented before and after key times of the day, including entering and e exiting campus and bathroom use. Uh, there are an adequate number of bathrooms and hand washing stations open and available throughout campus, including in classrooms. Uh, and signage will be present on how to safely wash, wash hands and limit occup occupancy uh, in the restrooms. Um, we will be in incorporating our PBIS system to educate and reinforce the healthy behaviors we'd like to see here on campus and potentially giving out Puma stars for hand washing and mask use. Um, all classroom air filters have been updated to the highest grade, which is the MERV 13, which is what is used in hospitals. Uh, and HVAC si systems will be um, running throughout the day for airflow. And, and additionally, we'll have all the windows and doors open uh, to incorporate as much fresh airflow as possible. Next slide, please. Um, oh, go back one, please. <laughs> 
Um, one thing I wanted to note is important to note the difference between cleaning and sanitation. Uh, when we talk about cleaning, we're talking about the removal of dirt, spots, or waste. Sanitizing, on the other hand, is the use of a chemical to disinfect a surface. Uh, for the most part, this includes the use of a fogging or missing machi misting machine uh, in all rooms that are used on campus. At Nesbitt School, we will follow all San Mateo County guidelines on cleaning and san sanitizing to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. All custodial staff have been trained in how to properly disinfect the school. Uh, while also using the appropriate PPE, such as face coverings and hand and eye protection. All high traffic and commonly used services will be disinfected on a daily basis and according to a designated schedule. Uh, Custodial staff will only use CDC and EPA approved substances that are safe to be used at school. Uh, that currently includes a product called Rejuvenol from Hilliard. Um, and in addition to sanitation, custodial staff will also be cleaning restrooms and classrooms and clearly defined schedule, which includes having the trash emptied, the toilets and floors cleaned, uh, the vents dusted, and supplies restocked. It's very important to note that students will not be involved in disinfecting their classrooms or school. They will, however, be responsible for tidying up their area and materials uh, at the end of each day. Next slide. So um, before we move on to talking about the proposed model for the hybrid, I did want to shout out Mr. Walker and Rui for really working hard with our custodial staff to make sure that there are checklists provided, um, that there is a bathroom cleaning checklist, that there's all the marketing available that is needed around campus. We're providing um, marketing for teachers in their classrooms and just making sure that everything is really visual um, for our families, for our teachers, and for um, our students especially to understand as we transition in this way. Um, I saw in the chat some questions like, how are you gonna monitor the bathroom? Um, great question and not things that you, we would typically think of before. Um, we have um, in our plan um, identified certain classrooms that will be utilizing certain restrooms and we have spaced out and marked space in our restrooms for how many students we could safely accommodate. And we will have checkout procedures with our teachers and they're gonna have a lot of say and input um, in how we help Kind of transition the kids as they come back to school. So I just, I know they sound like strange procedures sometimes, right? But we are trying to work on all the right ways to visually cue our kiddos so that they, they know how to stay safe when they're here on campus. So the proposed um, elementary TK through eighth grade hybrid model. So you'll see that we have um, shifted a little bit from some previous conversations and from what is listed in our draft plan. And we will reopen under an AM PM model, which allows for groups of children to receive in-person instruction every day. So during the morning session, the A group of students will be in person while the B group is distance learning at home. Um, there will be a 90 minute window that allows for um, teachers to have their lunch and prep, as well as for the custodial team to sanitize and prepare the classrooms for the PM group's arrival. In the afternoon, um, the B group of students receives in-person instruction while the A group um, is distance learning at home. Um, in this model, there is no recess and the students will not be eating lunch on campus. This is different than what is outlined in our draft plan. So I want you all to please take note of that. Um, teachers are working with us to map out meaningful instructional rotations. And we'll take a look at some sample times on the next slide. So as mentioned, um, our Nesbitt staff is fully engaged in the process of mapping out an, infect an effective instructional day for the hybrid model. You'll see here that there are some staggered times and approaches for the AM slots as well as the PM slots. Um, though this is a sample of how timings could work, we are still uh, making some site specific adjustments. Um, I feel like this is a pretty good start and I don't foresee any great changes from what is mapped out here, but it is definitely not finalized. Um, it's an excellent starting point um, and um, it gets us a good feel of what direction the day of the day will go, but we are still refining it and working on this with our with teachers input. Um, not displayed on this chart. Oh, thanks, Laura. <laughs> not displayed on this chart is our special day class. Um, 
and their schedule is going to be consistent of that with an AM time slot. And our SDC team is working closely with our director of special programs, Laura Goldman, and they will clearly have a defined instructional day and that they are working hard so that we are communicating that with our families in a timely way. So to review these two slides, because it is um, an added change. Um, we are reopening with, a, with an AM PM model that consists of two and a half hours of instruction in the morning, a 90 minute cleaning window, and then two and a half hours of instruction in the afternoon. No campus recess or lunch. Next slide. So there are a lot of things to consider. Please know that we will prioritize for our Nesbitt families. We will do our absolute best to maintain as much consistency as possible. We cannot accommodate every request when it comes to reopening considerations, but we will make sure that Nesbitt siblings are provided the same AM or PM designation. At this time, we can't answer questions regarding um, class lists or teacher assignments. Our teachers are engaging in their binding survey and we will be working double time uh, to ensure that we are offering the best hybrid and distance uh, learning choices possible. We will do all we can to accommodate what our parents indicate on their surveys. So I encourage you all, once those surveys are released, to please um, consider what's been reviewed this evening and take your surveys. Um, with with um, the choices um, and the change in model, there will be a need to shift teacher and student assignments. Um, the availability of hybrid space may be limited based upon the staffing capacity. And in some instances, our students participating in distance learning may be paired with the students from other school sites. Um, I know I've participated in a, um, our, PTA, our last PTA meeting and what came up from our families was making sure that there was a transition time where if students were going to be receiving instruction from a teacher that wasn't necessarily their own, that those teachers would have time to communicate. Um, I can um, attest that principals were able to share that with cabinet and everyone is working on making sure that there is ample time for, a, for shifts to be positive and that teachers are be able to um, be informed um, about the new students that they may potentially be receiving. So I just wanna put that out there. That is, that is all in our, um, our minds and our hearts. We wanna make sure that this is positive for our kids. They've been through enough when it comes to um, how they've had to start their school year. Next slide. This leads us to the what ifs, right? And this points out to some what ifs that um, uh, Rui had mentioned in the beginning. We will continue to move forward with our plans to reopen with hybrid, um, with the hybrid option for families, assuming BRSSD is in the orange or yellow tier approaching January 19th. Um, we will continue to monitor um, tier designation and determine um, which date will, you know, will make the call, whether we're moving forward or postponing January 19th open. There will be a board meeting on December 16th where this will all be evaluated. But, but here are some thoughts that we have at this time. We will move forward with the binding family survey as planned, regardless of the county tier. Uh, families are making the decision for when they reopen, for when we reopen under orange or yellow constraints only. Um, we will move forward with our staff alignment um, and we will have staff and student assignments scheduled and solidified so that we are ready to go uh, once the county is reassigned to orange or yellow. So we are um, taking this planning time seriously so that we are prepared um, when we make the shift to hybrid. Next slide. So some additional what ifs, um, and this comes to the health and safety of our kiddos. So what if my child is in, as a close contact to someone outside of the school environment? So students must follow the 14 day quarantine period if they are designated as a close contact. Um, and then what if my child is a close contact but receives a negative COVID test? Couldn't they just return to school? So the answer is no, um, because the incubation period and the transmission, transmission period, um, you, are, you are not able to test out of a quarantine. So all close contacts will um, be required to adhere to that strict 14 day quarantine timeline. So what's important to note here though, is that um, 
if this were to happen to a student, they would not be penalized. Um, there needs to be open communication so that we're able to provide asynchronous work and support for students and families if a child were to be unable to attend school if they had chosen the hybrid path. Next slide. Right, some very important dates about that binding survey uh, that Ryan was talking about. Uh, on November 23rd, all families will receive a personalized email asking for their binding learning preference for their child. You will have one of three options. You can remain in a full distance learning model. You can participate in the in-person hybrid model, which we've uh, described here today. Or your third option is to remain with your current teacher, whether that be in a distance learning or hybrid model, depending on where that teacher is assigned. Uh, and then you should receive notification on or before January 6th. It's really important that you get uh, your binding surveys in ASAP. Um, it's well, one thing, it's easy to let it linger uh, and, and not get it back in. But the other thing is, is the the with the more speed that you respond, that gives us more information uh, sooner and we are able to get information back out to you uh, more quickly. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just sort of a for your information, but uh, BRSSD will host and facilitate a, a panel of medical professionals to discuss COVID-19 and school reopening. Um, stakeholders will have the opportunity to su submit questions for discussion. Um, the one that you probably want to be focusing on is the one on the left, reopening safely, uh, community focus on November 30th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. Next slide, please. And thank you. Oh, Ryan. <laughs> Ryan, I think you're muted. There you go. Muted. <laughs> So, that, so that's the thank you slide, but we wanted to make sure that um, we kind of got through um, a big bulk of information so that we did have time to address some, some questions. But um, I want to close by just saying thank you to our Nesbitt School community. Thank you for believing in us. Thank you for trusting us. Um, and just please know that we are committed to a safe reopening. Um, Nick, go ahead and please put in the chat the, the link for our, our draft plan. Um, and again, th there's access to that on BRSSD's website and um, as well as BRSSD's uh, reopening plan is linked as well. Um, so we have, a, we have a few moments to go ahead and take some questions with Rui and Laura here to help um, assist us and address some things that have been popping up in the chat. So Rui and Laura, could you please help us? Sure. <clears throat> Let's see, lots of thank yous. So we appreciate that. Thank you very much for the uh, positive um, feedback. So uh, for distance learning, how many students will be in each class? So we will maintain a balanced class size. Um, the class sizes, um, we, try, we, don't, we do not go over 25. We like to keep it a, a balanced class. It's also gonna really depend on our survey numbers, but we wanna make sure that we are creating class environments that are, that are balanced and suitable for our students to be able, for our teachers to be able to deliver the best instruction that they possibly can. Rui, is there any kind of um, stipulation for uh, placement as we're collecting kind of survey data and deciding distance learning class size? Um, so class sizes will be limited by kind of the physical constraint. I know there have been a couple questions asking, you know, how does that work with current class size? And that is yeah. why we're breaking current classes into two cohorts and an AM and a PM cohort. Um, and uh, sorry, uh, what was the second part of that? It was um, making sure we're adhering to distance learning class size Yep, exactly. So the hybrid class sizes will essentially each cohort will be half of what um, students are receiving in distance learning. Mm -hmm. um, I also saw a couple of questions um, around kind of a shift to distance learning. So I wanted to clarify that a little bit. Um, so first is defining close contact, which is close contact is defined as um, being within six feet for 15 minutes um, of someone who is a confirmed case of COVID. So um, someone who maybe is symptomatic and quarantining just to be safe isn't actually a confirmed case until they receive a positive test. Um, if an entire cohort 
uh, needs to go on quarantine because there was a case in that, um, then that cohort would shift to distance learning. But if let's say one student in the cohort um, outside of school became a close contact, the rest of the class does not need to quarantine just that student and that student would receive um, asynchronous work, um, independent study work during that time. I see a lot of things popping up in the chat regarding um, with the start of hybrid with our counties, with our county now currently being in red. So I want to reiterate that we are moving forward with planning in preparation for reopening in January. Our board meeting is on December 16th, where we will have to reevaluate um, the safety of being able to launch this hybrid model or if there needs to be a pause based on tier because our board right now um, has considered opening in the yellow and orange tiers. Okay, so I, I, when we're taking our survey, you're making your choice for the rest for the rest of the school year. So I'm seeing a lot of questions about uh, choice, uh, teacher choice, AB uh, choice, and also when is the survey going to go out? So the, um, the selections when the survey goes out will be uh, distance learning, understanding that it may require a change in teacher um, hybrid learning, understanding that it may require a change in teacher, and I prefer to stick with my teachers regardless of which option they go with. Those will be the three options. Um, and so we'll basically take that data, triangulate with our staff preference, um, and assign classes in that way. And then what about the AB choice? We are not collecting uh, AB preferences. And regarding, like I had said before, we will prioritize AM PM designation for Nesbitt siblings. Um, but again, you know, other other preferences and requests are going to be limited. So I have a question, um, uh, Ryan, about what if we have children in two different grades and they walk, and the younger one would be walking around to the front of the school by herself while the middle schooler goes in through the back? How's that going to work? Yeah, so, so we know that we're going to have these types of situations. Of course, we're going to make sure that the younger student is not waiting alone. Um, we will have a holding area for walkers. We're also talking through our teachers when we're doing dismissal, making sure that we're um, kind of differentiating in our class who's walking today and making sure they're getting a head start to the, the area where they're either meeting a parent or in this case, possibly an older sibling and just making sure that our students are gonna know where to meet and to safely walk off campus together. Same thing for students that are, are know they're getting picked up by a car, making sure that they know where they're going to line up and get dismissed by their teacher. Of course, we wouldn't want a kiddo alone. So we would, we would accommodate and work those things out so that they're safely meeting each other and leaving campus safely. Uh, in a previous survey, there was a buddy family option. Will that be in this survey? So at this time, this is not an option in this current survey uh, because we are not doing uh, split days throughout the week. We're doing uh, AM, PM. I'm also seeing some questions uh, for clarification around what the, uh, the asynchronous component of hybrid will look like compared to the full distance learning. Can you speak to that? Sure. So during the, the time when, during the hybrid model, when the students are at home learning, so it's twofold, that will be a time when specials is going to happen. Um, it's also a time when uh, the students can participate in um, some asynchronous ass assignments that have been provided by their teacher. So really what is being presented, it's almost like prep work. The teacher could be preparing them for some assignments that they then need to asynchronously complete at home in preparation for their in-person learning. So it'll be a real blend of classwork and homework and plus a time for the students to receive all of their specials that will take place at the at-home time. Okay, so uh, some people have clarification questions about the travel rules. So if a family were to go traveling within California, or I think we should expand it to outside of California for midwinter or spring break, will the child have to stay out of the classroom for 14 days after the return? And how will the child get the assignments and instruction? 
So, Rui, you want to take that one? Uh, it was, sorry, about if someone is traveling. Traveling. And is there a difference between traveling inside California and outside California? Um, in um, terms of travel restrictions, the quarantine time. Yeah, I mean, the recommendation is really to not do any traveling, um, but from an instructional perspective, I think quarantining because of travel is being treated the same as quarantining because of exposure. Um, if it's the entire cohort, um, you know, then that entire cohort shifts to a distance learning model and otherwise it shifts to the independent study. Laura, I'm seeing some questions too, um, and I know, we're working on this. There are some questions about um, services and if kiddos will be receiving their learning center and speech during the asynchronous time. So uh, we're still working out the details of uh, this. Of course, we want to um, reduce as much as possible any cross-contamination among the, the cohorts. And uh, we will be working with the specialists to um, make their schedules uh, with their students and there will be changes in their schedules uh, so that to the greatest extent possible, they're not missing uh, classroom instruction and that their, uh, their services are provided during asynchronous time. And there are some students who may receive uh, some services in person. Uh, the degree to which we will be able to do this is yet to be determined. I also see in the chat some questions because I had mentioned that um, that the specials would be addressed during the distance piece. So um, we are going to be working um, with scheduling when it comes to PE and um, science uh, and those types of things. And then of course, I've noted down already how we'll address art in action and music for minors and those types of specials. So stand by where we're going to have to work out those details. So I'm seeing a lot of questions about the cleaning and sanitizing that happens and uh, the difference between the two, what exactly is happening during this 90 minute period and uh, what will happen uh, after school in terms of cleaning that's different. Yeah, so um, the difference between cleaning and sanitization, cleaning is sort of removing grime. Sanitization is a chemical process that removes germs and bacteria. Um, so we have these electric um, fogging machines that are spraying a chemical. So the EPA has a list, list N of chemicals that are approved to treat COVID um, along with rest time. So how long that chemical has to be in contact um, in order for that surface to cons be considered, uh, you know, sanitized. Um, so we're working with chemicals um, that are also uh, less harsh. Um, so peroxide or acid-based um, or citric acid-based. Um, and uh, essentially what is going to be happening is that in between cohorts, our custodians will be fully spraying down and fogging up the room between cohorts. Um, this does mean less time for uh, typical cleaning activities, picking up papers, things like that. Those are areas that um, we're, we're looking to our community to help with ensuring that the cleanliness aspect, um, again, things like leaving out materials um, are done so that our custodians can be focusing on the sanitization. I'm continuing to see a couple questions um, around kind of the preference for, for parents and the survey that comes along. Um, and we are uh, spelling out in that language that essentially the selection is uh, first of all binding. Um, and second of all, it's essentially telling us what is the most important thing. So if the most important thing is to stay in distance learning, um, recognizing that may come with a switch in teacher, or the most important thing is hybrid learning. Um, we will do our best, obviously, to uh, minimize class changes, but that if you decide the most important thing is a certain model, or the most important thing is to um, continue with your teacher, whatever their selection is. Um, so I think the trade-off there is I saw a couple questions of if I elect to stay with my teacher, but then they don't pick the model that I want, can I switch? Um, and the answer is no, we're going to do one class reassignment. So if you have a model that you feel really strongly about, um, then that is the priority uh, to select. 
uh, teachers are given the same survey um, and the same binding survey around whether they are teaching in distance or hybrid. Uh, and we are working really closely, um, obviously, with our with our teachers um, and with BRSFA about that. I saw a few questions around that as well. Um, this model actually came from our teachers. This switch um, is coming uh, at the request of our teachers. I saw a question pop up again about um, if a student has to quarantine, um, what will be their process for instruction? So they will be provided asynchronous learning. So just like if there was a sick kid in class, um, teachers provide them with their work so that they can keep up. So we would provide them with asynchronous support if they were in the hybrid model. So I'm seeing a lot of questions about um, what kind of instruction students get in quarantine. I think, teen, I think there's still some confusion over this um, versus the, the whole class quarantines, then the teacher uh, will provide distance learning, just like we're providing distance learning right now. Uh, but if only one student is in quarantine or one student is, um, is quarantining uh, because they had a contact outside of, um, of their classroom or because they traveled, then that student will get um, assignments to do at home, much like they would have gotten if uh, they had a sick day. Uh, there were also a couple questions earlier um, around childcare. Um, that's going to be uh, specific to the partners that we're working with at each site. Um, we have met with our, our childcare partners as well to tell them about our model and we'll be working with them around space models, et cetera. Um, but in terms of what specific offering uh, you'll have at your site, um, I would reach out to the, uh, the partner at So Footsteps um, to find out what their plans are. Uh, and unfortunately, um, I've seen a couple questions around this um, because of the timing of the surveys. Um, and I'm trying to, sorry, pull up the specific timing of when the parent survey will go out if someone has that handy, but you will not be able to know your teacher selection um, prior to receiving your survey. Yeah, the family preference goes out on November 23rd. I saw a question about Wednesday. Thank you for um, uh, bringing that up. So on Wednesdays, they are, it's to be determined right now, we're going to, we have um, to go through negotiations when it comes to Wednesdays, but the hope is that there will be a short, there will be shortened AB groups um, where students will able will be able to receive face-to-face -face instruction. However, kind of um, the plan for the time frame for Wednesdays still needs to be negotiated and that will be shared um, as soon as we have more information. So we have some time to take uh, just a few more questions. So um, Rui and Laura, was there anything pressing that we could we could address right now? Um, well, just one uh, another question about AB and how it will be decided uh, by last name. And at this time, no, we will uh, be triangulating all of the data uh, to see where the students um, the students end up in a hybrid or distance um, model uh, preference, and also. Uh, where the teachers are available and uh, what shuffling we may need to do uh, as minimally as possible of uh, the students among the teachers. Uh, I'm also seeing a few things around a transition um, back into full distance learning. Mm -hmm. So the state criteria um, is, sorry, I'm trying to just pull up the specific numbers, um, but essentially the criteria for opening is um, right now filling out being in red, orange, or yellow state criteria, not board criteria, um, and completing that application to open. Once you are open, the criteria for closing is no longer tied to tiers. Instead, it is about the spread rates at the school. Um, so it is, I believe, do we have that slide, Laura? Do you know? Oh. Um. Let me look back. Uh, five percent. So at five percent um, of a school testing positive for COVID, the school would close. 
Um, obviously, if there's a if there is a case within the cohort, the co entire cohort would obviously would actually quarantine. If it reaches five percent within a school, the school would close. Um, and I believe five percent um, within the across schools, uh, there's a threshold at which the entire district would shift to distance learning as well. I have a question about if you're doing distance learning, but you end up assigned to another teacher in a different school, do you still belong to the Nesbitt community or you're part of the new school community? You're still part of the Nesbitt community. Um, and, and this is um, going to be the challenging piece of this, making sure we are all together and unified as a district for those students that are going to be poss the possibility of being assigned a different teacher that may not be their home teacher to make sure that we are welcoming our kids and that they feel supported while they're um, going through their choice of, of picking distance learning. We want it to be the most positive experience possible. Uh, next question, can you please clarify if the kids will have Zoom class during the time they are not in class or if they will be on their own doing homework? So they will be doing asynchronous assignments and we're still determining exactly what that will look like. Uh, but no, they will not be on a Zoom class if they are in person during either the morning or the afternoon. Unless of course they are in a special or receiving a service during their at home time. And those would be by appointment, just like how the students are receiving them now. They would toggle between those different Zoom links. And again, our teachers will be very specific with what the asynchronous time will, will look like. That is why Nesbitt has opted to have teacher input sessions because our teachers will be planning the instructional day and communicating that in detail, just as we did when we shared our distance learning plans with you all. There will be um, uh, synchronized schedules. Our grade level teams work very closely together. Our middle school team is completely in sync um, and they have already started the planning of um, making sure that the in-person day um, is meaningful and that the asynchronous day is supportive of that in-person learning. I saw a question asking um, if the school were to move to full distance learning again, whether there would be another class reassignment and the answer is no. Um, we. We know that being changing teachers is disruptive and it's why uh, there will only, that will only happen once this year. Um, so if the entire school moves to distance learning, students will stay with that teacher. Um, I am also seeing a question around, uh, you know, I mentioned that reopening is based off of this proposal that we submit to the county. So is there a chance we submit it and it gets rejected? Um, we, it is really a open dialogue. Uh, much of this, uh, you know, navigating COVID in general, I would say has been an open dialogue. Uh, so in the same way that we are constantly seeking feedback um, from our community, from our staff. Um, we are in active dialogue with the county around the components of our uh, application. So by the time they receive it, nothing on there will be something that they haven't heard before. Um, and, and we're constantly asking them for that guidance. Um, I see a question on here around the plan for emergency response in case of earthquake or fire. Uh, yes, so um, Mr. Walker could probably speak to that a bit, but we are actively making sure that we're reviewing our um, earthquake drills and fire drills um, as we prepare for the hybrid model. We are reviewing those um, protocols with our teachers, as well as making sure that when we are back in person, those emergency drills will be implemented district-wide. So all schools will need to um, participate in those drills so students know what to do in the case of an emergency. Yes, basically the drills we anticipate will look very similar to what they did without uh, without a hybrid model. It will just be with social distancing in mind. So, an earth, you know, the procedures for an earthquake drill are going to be very similar. Um, just when we're gathering and, and reconvening at the end, just to, to keep social distancing in mind. Um, and for parents who opt for uh, continuing in distance learning, will they continue to have a similar schedule as they do now, or will that shift to look like the hybrid schedule? Um, they will. They will maintain the schedule uh, with some small shifts, but they will maintain um, uh, 
in line with what they are receiving currently when it comes to their distance learning schedule. There will be some shifts here and there, especially if there's a teacher reassignment um, or a shuffle of some kind, but they can expect um, instruction to be just as rigorous as, as it were right now. And then we, we could take uh, two more questions before we do have to log off so that Sandpiper can start their town hall on time or Mr. Walker also shares his time. So he's supporting Nesbitt and Sandpiper tonight. So go Mr. Walker, thank you. Uh, I'm seeing uh, some additional questions around, um, you know, parents who are wondering if they'll be able to uh, shift from hybrid to distance. Um, so as we mentioned, uh, we, we do not want to uh, have students be switching a teacher um, a second time in the school year. Um, of course, safety is our number one priority. Um, and we are being more conservative than state guidelines. You know, the state has said, you may return in red, we are saying orange or yellow. Um, similarly, if a case comes up, for instance, where we are seeing that, um, there needs to be repeated quarantining of multiple cohorts. Um, it doesn't mean that we are necessarily going to wait until hitting that state threshold to move to distance learning. Um, safety is absolutely our number one priority. Anything final, Ruby, that we can um, address here before I close? Um, I'm seeing just in general, uh, you know, questions around um, staff as well. So perhaps I know you mentioned working with staff, but maybe talking a little bit more about how this has been co-developed uh, with our staff. Sure. So um, again, uh, we developed the hybrid plans and we shared them immediately with our staff. And at Nesbitt, we have a very detailed schedule of when our teachers will be having um, meetings with Nick and I, where they're providing input and planning sessions with us. So we've already met with our middle school team. They're getting started planning away. We've met with our uh, preliminary meeting with our TKK and first grade teachers. And we have meetings on the calendar scheduled It's actually laid out and detailed in our hybrid distance learning, um, excuse me, our hybrid reopening plan, the draft, um, when we are meeting with our teachers. Our goal at Nesbitt is by December 16th to have solidified our, um, plan for reopening. We want to make sure that our teachers are really focused on planning their instruction so that we're not focused on worrying about um, the ingress and egress plan. Let Nick and I kind of brainstorm that, but give our teachers as much brain power and space as possible to plan instructions so that we can support them and pump out that information to our families. Um, so, so our teachers are engaged in the full process. And I think that um, our Nesbitt families know how incredible our teachers are. And as a new principal in this district, and especially at this school, they have been um, so motivated in the care for um, not only designing a meaningful distance learning experience, but for what this shift to a hybrid could mean. Um, and they are completely dedicated to the process. And I'm so proud of them and so thankful for um, the rigor that they have for their work. It is um, a true commitment to your kids. And so with that, um, we have captured many things in the chat um, on Adopt Care for questions where we will provide an FAQ. Um, we are sharing these with Dan Deguara to make sure that they're out in community communication. But I also wanna remind our Nesbitt families, I host virtual coffee every Wednesday. I'm assuming they're going to be very popular from now until uh, December when we're talking through these plans and I welcome that. I am available to talk through things, to hear your feedback, for me to brainstorm things with you. We are in this together. And what, um, what that means is um, what I've learned joining this school is that family is strong and our Nesbitt Ohana um, cares about our kids and has um, a great support system. So I'm looking forward to collaborating with you through this process and we'll get through it and it'll be great. Um, and your kids are gonna learn and thrive. And um, I mean that with my whole heart. So go Pumas and thank you for joining us tonight. We will make sure that this information is um, posted and reshared. Um, and again, see you at Wednesday's virtual parent coffee. Thank you everyone. Thank you everyone.